Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is the continuation of Colonel Jack Moore's uh, Reasons of the Marks of Israel. Who's Israel? This is part six, but on uh, part six of the audio studies, my part six. But this is part, uh, his part 13. And he writes that Israel will be an undefeated nation. And he quotes Isaiah 54, 17 and Micah 5, 8, which I really, I don't, I don't see it. But, and he writes that the English speaking nations of the world have never fought a losing war. And he says, we're not talking about police actions such as Korea and Vietnam, which was fought under the United Nations. I mean, this is why the children of the devil, and I mean actual children of the devil, trick us into fighting each other, like England and Russia against, and the United States against Germany and what have you. So, um... Because let's face it, has any country in Africa ever defeated an, an English-speaking country? No. Um, how about an Asian country? No. You know, uh, up to this point. Um, how about a South American or country? No. Now, in you had General Douglas MacArthur. Some people like him, some people don't. I'm not going to get into all that because I don't hardly know all the facts. But he was responsible for the island hopping strategy during World War II in the Pacific. And uh, in... Some ways he was pretty good. In other ways, I don't know. Could have been better. But, you know, it's easy easier to look back on things and see your mistakes than, you know, when you're, when you're, it's actually going on. And you better believe these guys were probably only getting three, four hours of sleep a night, if that. Uh, but the thing was, MacArthur... And uh, Admiral Bull Halsey, and uh, let's see, who's the other one? Curtis LeMay. Let me tell you, uh, he was a Army Air Corps general, and they were the ones that firebombed Japan. But during Korea, MacArthur had to submit his battle plans in advance to the United Nations. Well, if you didn't know it, Soviet Russia was one of the top five Security Council members. So here it is. Russia is supplying pilots in Soviet-made MiG aircraft shooting at American aircraft. So here it is your fighting under the United Nations, and here it is you're telling your enemies what your battle plans are. Oh, yeah, we're going to be in Pusan tomorrow. So what do they do? They, they move their troops to Pusan, you know. And uh, Russian pilots were in Russian airplanes, MiGs, shooting down American airplanes during Korea. And some say Vietnam, too, but I don't know. And uh, uh, China, China, communist China was, uh, had sent troops killing American soldiers during the Korean conflict. You know, from what I understand, the United States never declared war against North Korea. And, you know, they kept saying, well, we don't want to escalate things, so, you know, but, uh, MacArthur wanted to nuke China. Yeah. 
and the traitor Harry Truman uh, relieved him of command for wanting to do that. Personally, I wish they would have done it. Uh, maybe that would have uh, let the Chinese know you don't mess with the U.S., but now uh, look how far we've fallen. And Vietnam, they wouldn't let the boys win either. Um, I was actually in the Army during the time of the Vietnam War. It was winding down. Uh, and they were starting to bring everybody home when I went in. But from what I understand, uh, I had a medic, guy that was a medic, uh, Army medic. He told me that uh, cayenne pepper on bullet wounds would stop the bleeding. But the military would not let them use it. And he was lamenting over the fact of how many of the boys died because they couldn't stop the bleeding. I mean, you know, when you get a bullet hole in you, you know, it leaks blood. And then after you lose so much, you die. Well, you supposedly, if you take red pepper and put it on it, it stops the bleeding, causes the, cl the, the clot. And we never declared war against Vietnam either. So I don't know. But uh, yeah. So here it is. You had Russian and Chinese troops, uh, mil military people, uh, t you know, fighting against the Americans in Korea. And uh, did we fight them like we fought Germany? No. Did we fight them like we fought Japan? No. No, we were fighting with one arm tied behind our back. So, you know, it's just horrible. Um, from what I understand, I don't know how much Korean War history you know, but um, the uh, General Douglas MacArthur was a brilliant tactician when it came to uh, amphibious landings. You know, you're out at sea and then you're going to land troops on land. He was an absolute tactical genius with that because, you know, he had years of experience during World War II, island hopping. So what he did was he landed at, I think it's a port called Incheon or a bay or something like that. It's, it's uh, near Seoul, their capital, which is near the North Korean, South Korean border. He landed troops there. And the troops cut off all the supply lines of the North Korean and Chinese troops that were almost ready to push the American soldiers into the sea and the southernmost part of Korea. They called it the Pusan Perimeter. Well... When you land troops there, the areas were lightly defended because all their troops were at the south and they were able to stop all the trucks with all the bullets going down and stop all the food and everything else, you know. And uh, they were able to push back the uh, North Koreans. Or wait a minute, I'm getting it mixed up. Uh, China wasn't involved then. It, that came later. Well, from what I understand, there was Chinese involved, uh, but they were considered consultants and not combatants, but uh, that would change. But the thing is, MacArthur was only successful doing that because he forgot to notify the UN his battle plans. Yeah. You know, the United Nations created the Israeli state in 1948. So what does that tell you? And guess who was behind communism? Yeah. Tell you what, people, get a book called Behind Communism. Behind Communism by author Frank Britton, B-R-I-T-T-O-N. And uh, yeah, the same people that created the UN created communism. So... Uh, all right, well, enough of that stuff. And by the way, uh, 
Colonel Moore saw communism in first-hand action. I mean, you know, this he, he, he knew what it was all about. So, they withheld information from uh, the frontline battle troops that would have made a difference in combat. You know, it's they wanted as many of our people dead as possible. It looks like it, really. Same thing in Vietnam. You know, can you imagine that? Chinese troops are attacking and killing American soldiers. And Truman says, oh, no, you can't use a nuke on China. Well, you use two of them on Japan. You know? So this is what we are up against. And by the way, 50% of the two, three, and four-star generals in the army are the same people that uh, were behind the United Nations and the creation of the state that state in 1948 and who are behind communism and everything else. I can't mention any names because, yeah, you get the idea. All right, number 14 says Israel will win their final war with a relatively small army. And he quotes Leviticus 26 and verse 8 and Deuteronomy 20 and verse 1. So, now the thing is, these promises generally only seem to apply when we are obedient. I mean, really. And by the way, um, the only nation that ever defeated a white nation in a, ba a major battle was Japan in uh, 1905 in the Russian-Japanese War. But they didn't defeat Russia totally. There was just a couple of battles. Well, actually, they wiped the floor with Russia. <laughs> they really did. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it, you know, they didn't defeat Russia totally. It's just that they wiped out their navy. So, all right, so Israel will win their final war with a relatively small army. Uh, he writes, in our coming conflict with Russia and very probably China, uh, by the way, uh, our friends in the Middle East took some, took a German submarine uh, dolphin class, and if anybody knows submarines, it's Germany. Uh, dolphin class, uh, diesel electric submarine, and uh, they gave it to China so that they could reverse engineer it and copy it. But China has more submarines than the United States now, and they also have a what's called a deep water navy. I mean. We're in big trouble. And the majority of Americans are asleep. So, plus China probably has the largest land army uh, of infantry in the world. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. So, Colonel Moore, now you got to realize this was written probably back in the 90s, early 90s, all this information. Keep that in mind. In our coming conflict with Russia and very probably China, plus the black nations of Africa, Israel will be greatly outnumbered. And yet, we are promised ultimate victory in Christ. He writes, the, uh, the Yunahus, while defeating the greatly numerical Arab armies, did it through the use of American equipment, not through the help of God, most of whom of them denounce so there is some difference here. And this is in reference to the, uh, six, I think it was the 67 war, they called it. So, number 15, Israel will be a wealthy nation. And he quotes Deuteronomy 8.18. So, let's take a look at that real quick. Deuteronomy 8.18. All right, let's read uh, Deuteronomy 8.18. 
But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. For it is he, the Lord, that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which ye swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. For those of you that want a transcript on YouTube, uh, go to bo where below, uh, to the right-hand side, underneath the video, there's three dots. Click on it, and then click Transcript. And you can read um, a voice-to-text generated transcript. So, uh, I've heard it said that wealth comes from the ground. And let's face it, it growing food, uh, the white nations have excelled in growing food. I mean, absolutely have. We are the greatest farmers the world has ever known. But it's not because of any greatness in our hands. No, the Lord gave it to us. So let's read verse 19. And it shall be, if thou do it all, forget the Lord, forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. Wow. Has our country worshipped other gods? Do you know that in 1966, um, the creation of the Church of Satan? Oh, yeah. Honestly, I think there's more witches in this country than there are Christians. I could be wrong, but I don't think so. We have, as a nation, forgotten the Lord. And repentance is in order. If you read James chapter 1, you know, even Satan, even the devils believe in God, but they're not obedient to him. God wants us to turn from our wicked ways and follow him. And there's even people claiming to be preachers now that tell you that Repent just means to turn from not believing God to believing in God. Hey, uh, you know, but does Satan believe in God? Absolutely he does. No. And then they'll try to confuse you by saying God repented. You know, there's a difference between sinful man and a holy, righteous God in heaven the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He does not have sin to repent of. We do. Absolutely. So, and the only reason they can get away with this is because people don't bother to read their Bible. They won't bother. So, you forget the Lord, walk after other gods, serve them, worship them, he says, I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroyed before your face, so shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient. Ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. Wow. So what's this about being a wealthy nation? Now remember, this is probably in the early 90s when he wrote this. Israel will be a wealthy nation. The gross national product of the Israelis in 1980, all right, 1980, was about 16.4 billion. That of the United States is 2.5 trillion. That of Canada, 249.3 billion. That of Australia, 119.1 billion. That of New Zealand, 20.2 billion. And that of South Africa, 54.9 billion. That of Britain, 346.6 billion. That means that the nations of Christendom, true Israel, has a yearly GNP, gross national product, of about 3.289 trillion, 
compared with the 16.4 billion for the Israelis. And as I've mentioned previously, um, Israeli leaders know that if the U.S. were to withdraw their support from them, they would soon collapse. Yeah. Uh, um, all right, number 16. Israel will lend to others but not borrow. And he quotes Deuteronomy 15.6. However, this is a conditional promise, which we have broken, by the way. Since the end of World War II, the United States has supplied other nations. This is through the end of 1979. More than 200 and 46 billion in military, economic, and technical aid and loans. Of this, only 75 billion has been in loans. The rest has been in the form of gifts to the you know who's over in the Middle East. For instance, we have given 12 billion plus with only 4.4 billion repaid. But during this time, as the U.S. has drawn away from God, we have begun to borrow from the International Ban Curs, who are almost 100% you know who's, who control the, well, take out, uh, take out a, uh, your wallet or purse, open it up, pull out a dollar bill or twenty dollar or ten or five whatever you got and look what it says it'll say uh federal and then something else and then note that is a private bank yeah a private bank controls our money um in one year, we borrowed more than 80 billion at huge interest rates so that we could give it away, often to nations who hate us. The conditions of Deuteronomy 2844 are now at work in this country. Quote, he shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. Yeah. And... You know what? I, I don't want to be the tail because when you lift up the tail and you look at the exit hole, guess what comes out of that? Yeah. Um, I'm not trying to be crude, but you know. Um, number 17. Israel was to abolish the slave trade. And that is in Isaiah 58 verse 6. All right, let's read uh, Isaiah 58 and verse 6. Is this not the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every loke, yoke. Personally, I think he's talking about our people, but Colonel Morris thinks it's... Uh, slavery in general but i'm not going to say he's wrong so um so who abolished the slave trade well the anglo-saxon people did britain was first in 1834 and then the united states in 1865. you know the muslims to this day still practice uh slavery yeah, which is why I laugh at black Muslims. You know, they they cry and complain about slavery, and yet their uh, Islamic brothers would uh, sell them into slavery in a heartbeat. So, number 18. Israel was to have the finest fruit and cattle in the world. Deuteronomy 38, verse 4. Again, conditional. Let's take a look at that. 
Deuteronomy 38. Um, <laughs> there is no Deuteronomy 38 or Leviticus. So I don't know. I don't know if this is actually a actual copy I have or if somebody changed all this stuff. So I don't know. Uh, all I know is in 1979, the total Israeli production of cattle was under 50,000 head, while that of the U.S. alone is in the hundreds of millions. And if you ask me, why do the Israelis always want someone to come over to Israel and plant a tree for them? You ever seen the uh, campaign they have? Plant a tree for Israel. Why don't you plant it yourselves? Oh, wait, the curse of Cain. Remember, God told Cain that his uh, the land would never yield her strength unto him. Let's read that real quick. That's in Genesis chapter 4. All right, Genesis 4, verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. He killed him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Hey, Lord, it's not my day to watch him. Uh, verse 10, And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou, Cain, and now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, when you till the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. You can till the ground, but... You can plant trees all you want, but they're not going to fruit for you. No way, buddy boy. And uh, a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. You ever heard the expression, the wandering you-know-who? Yeah, who does that represent more than anybody else on the earth? The wandering you-know-who. Um, yeah. That's why they want you to go to over there and plant a tree for them. Verse 13. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. So, if you could never be a farmer, uh, well, let's get back to that. 14. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. Now, if you could never be a farmer, what kind of jobs would you have to be? Well, you'd have to get a job as a merchant or, you know, a trader, trading. Although you could be in the military, be a traitor. Um, you know, maybe insurance, banking. How about pharmaceutical? Yeah. Yeah, those would be some good jobs because, you know, if you couldn't grow food, you'd have to do everything but, right? Yeah. All right. So um, let's see. Number 19, Israel was to lose her identity and become known by another name. Huh. And he quotes Isaiah 65 and verse 16. We'll read that in a second. They were no longer to be called Hebrews, but Christians. And their nation's Christendom. The Jews today are still called Jews, aren't they? Oh, yeah. So let's take a look. I've actually had people tell me that uh, Christian's a bad name. I did a video on that. Can you imagine that? Oh, that's a bad name, Christian. 
ooh, bad name. But they don't go to uh, the rabbi's site and complain about, you know, them. No. All right, Isaiah 65. They wrote uh, verse 16, but it's not 16. It's 15, 1, 5. Um, let's read 14. Behold, my servants, the Lord's servants, shall sing for joy of heart, but ye shall cry for sorrow of heart, and shall howl for vexation of spirit. And ye shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen, for the Lord God shall slay thee, and call his servants by another name, and call his servants by another name. Wow. Uh, Christians, right? Yeah, I think so. So let's take a look. Christian has a name. Now, I did a video on this, but we're going to just cut, cut into this real quick. In the book of Acts, chapter 11, verse 26. And when he had found them, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year uh, they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And by the way, from what I understand, that's where the Bible came, our Bible came from. So is Christian a bad name? Huh. Well, let's talk to Paul. Well, we can't talk to Paul yet, but let's, let's see what Paul had to say. Or in Acts 26 and verse 28 on, then Agrippa, king, he was King Agrippa. Now, they're talking to Paul here. He's in, he's, he's being jailed as a prisoner. And they're going through a trial here. And Paul is relaying, relaying all this information about how he became a Christian and how he came to Christ and all these other things. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. King Agrippa says to Paul, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. What did Paul say? Oh, no, no, don't, do, don't use that Christian word. That's a bad name. I don't, uh-uh, no, 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 don't call me that. No, that's not what he said. Verse 29. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou... But also all that hear me this day were both almost and all together such as I am except these bonds. Paul's telling him, I, I wish all of you were Christians too. It's strange Paul never said, don't call me by that bad name. No. Is there a second witness? First Peter. Chapter 4 and verse 16. Peter writes, if any man suffer as a Christian, what? That's a bad name. Yeah, it's only a bad name when you're learning things from the you-know-whos. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Seems like Peter had no problem with the name Christian either. Seems only the you-know-whos have problems with the name Christian or Jesus. And if you want to know who's behind all this, well, go to the book of John, read chapter 5 and verse 16. And therefore did the you-know-whos persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. So who wanted to kill Jesus? Eh, it wasn't the Romans. Nope. Absolutely not. So Israel was to lose her identity and become known by another name. They weren't called Hebrews anymore, but Christians. 
Verse 20. I'm sorry, not verse 20. Um, huh. His point number 20. Israel's national heraldry was to feature the lion and the unicorn. Both of these animals or symbols are found on the official seal of Great Britain. Think about it. And the unicorn is not a horse with a horn sticking out of its head. That's been changed to that, but it, that's not what it originally was. It was the uh, one-horned Asian rhino. Matter of fact, its name is Unicornus, Unicorn, Unicornus rhinoceros, or rhinoceros. I'm not sure how they pronounce it. You know, it's a Latin word. Latin is very, very prominently uh, in the English language. Verse 20, uh, I'm sorry, point number 21. Israel was to be a great missionary people. Over 95% of all Christian missionary effort comes from the United States and England. Uh, the you-know-whos have never done this. So let's take a look at the scriptural references that he mentions here. All right, he quotes Isaiah 43, verse 21. This people, Israel, have I formed for myself they shall show forth my praise. If Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, we are the only group who have shown forth his praise, when you think about it. All right, let's see. What else does he show? Mark. Book of Mark. All right, Mark 16, verse 15. Chapter 16, verse 15. Jesus speaking, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Have the, you know who's ever done that? No. He also calls Matthew 7 and verse 20. So maybe we could take a look at that. All right, Matthew 7, 20. Jesus says, Wherefore by their fruits their works, ye shall know them. Yeah. Uh, point number 22. Israel was to be named after Isaac and were not to be called Israel. And he quotes Genesis 21, 12 and Romans 9, 7. They were to be known as Isaac's sons. You ever heard of Leif Eric's son? He was the son of Eric. Uh, that's what that means. Anderson, son of Ander. That was a Scandinavian thing. But Isaac's sons became Saxons or Saxons. So let's take a look at Genesis 21. Uh, okay. And God said unto Abraham, now we're talking about Ishmael here. I've got an entire study on God's promises and covenants to Abraham. And I have another one on Ishmael, the father of the Arabic nations, of many of whom are related to Abraham. And Abraham's wife uh, gave, told uh, Abraham to go in unto Hagar, his, her handmaid, and have a son by her because her womb was barren. And then she had a son. But then later, God uh, gave Sarah a son. 
And, well, let's read verse 9. Genesis 21, 9. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking. So here it is. This son of the Egyptian woman was mocking Sarah's son, Isaac. Verse 10. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. For all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Not Ishmael, Isaac. And verse 13, And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. See, the Arabs are, a lot of them are Abraham's children. But they're not part of the covenant. So when they tell you Muhammad and uh, the Quran, no. That's Satan's counterfeit. You better believe it. And they'll even tell you that Muhammad was a greater prophet than Christ because he came afterwards. I don't think so. Matter of fact, I know so. Uh, part 23. Israel's name was to be called Great. Genesis 12, 2. I'm not going to read it. There's only one nation in the world with this name, our mother nation, Great Britain. Yeah, maybe I won't read it. All right, let's take a look at Revel uh, Genesis. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. A great nation. What do they call Great Britain? Ah. Do you know that uh, there was a centuries where Britain had the greatest, most powerful navy in the world? Centuries. Centuries. It wasn't until World War II, uh, after World War II, that uh, the United States, which came from Britain for the most part, surpassed Great Britain in naval force. Um, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Um, have we been blessed in the United States since 1948, when we blessed that little country over in the Middle East? Oh yeah, we've been blessed with uh, uh, the L, and then give me a B, and then a G, and then a T, and abortion, and... Church of Satan and witchcraft. Yeah, we've been... And, and inflation and uh, drought and hurricanes and earthquakes and tornadoes. Yeah, we've been really blessed, haven't we? Yeah. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Please, Lord, lift your blessings from us. We can't take very many more. Yeah, and I'm in uh, South Florida here. But, uh, yeah, the hurricane's nowhere near us now. And by the way, this is August 29, 2023. So, yeah, we got a hurricane coming. But it's on the other side of the state. And, yeah. Um, have you ever heard of the British people? 
British, B-R-I-T-I-S-H. Do you know that ish, I-S-H, is, means man? And Brit, B-R-I-T, means covenant in Hebrew. So British in Hebrew means covenant man. The British, Great Britain. The British are covenant man. You think that's just a coincidence? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, all right, one more thing. His part 24. Israel was to speak another language other than Hebrew. And he quotes Isaiah 28, verse 11. So let's go take a look at that real quick. All right, uh, Isaiah 28 and 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue, another tongue, language, not that gibberish you hear in the Pentecostal church. And with another tongue will he speak to his people. Um, I'm kind of hard on the Pentecostals. I've been to Pentecostal churches, and in some ways I like them better than the um, uh, Baptists. Baptists usually are kind of cold. Um, all right, but let's take a look at tongues real quick, because people tell me that uh, slithering around the floor and spouting gibberish out of their mouth is tongues. So, in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 28, And God has set some in the church, first apostles. Now remember, the foundation of New Jerusalem is the, the apostles. That's the foundation of the, the New Jerusalem. Oh boy, I guess I better prove that, huh? Yeah. All right, uh, Revelation 21 and verse 14. And the wall of the city, New Jerusalem, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So what was the greatest gift God could give? Um, first apostles, 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Secondarily, prophets. Prophets was, the prophets were, uh, if you were in the military, the generals are the top. And then you go below that, you got colonels, and then you got majors, captains, lieutenants, and then you got sergeants, and then privates. Think of it that way. So first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. So I believe I'm a teacher, but uh, so I guess that would make me around the captain's rank, captain or major, somewhere around there. So some people say I'm a major pain in the rear, but yeah. Thirdly, teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Did you notice that tongues are considered the least last gift? Did you catch that? Well, that's why I'm here to point it out. 1 Corinthians 12, 29. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But, earn, but covet earnestly the best gifts. And yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Do you know that uh, being a teacher or having the gift of healing is a lot better than the gift of tongues? Yeah, it is. I've asked for the gift of healing and I, 
Uh, so far, the Lord has said no. I would love to go to a children's hospital and empty that puppy out, but the medical profession would probably kill me before I got to the next floor, but yeah. 1 Corinthians 14, 5. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. Paul says he'd rather you have the gift of prophecy than speaking tongues. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues. Let's go down to verse 26. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. How is it then, brethren? When you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. Verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, not one Pentecostal church I've ever been to has ever followed this. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. If there ain't no interpreter, shut your mouth. That's what Paul says. So when you got 50 people going, that's of the devil. That is not of God. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So, yeah. All right, let's uh, let's keep going here. Isaiah twenty-eight eleven. Let me look that up real quick. All right, let's like take a look at Acts chapter two real quick. We're gonna read uh, part of it. Verse one. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing, mighty wind. That word wind there comes from pneumata, pneuma, a Greek word. Pneuma. You ever ha heard of pneumatic tools, air tools? Uh, <laughs> you, it's sometimes translated wind. Sometimes it's translated as spirit. Yeah. So, uh, the wind was kind of symbolic of the Spirit. You can't see it, but you know it's there because it's blowing. You see the leaves moving. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Uh, these are the true ones, not the uh, Revel second chapter of Revelation and uh, verse number uh, 789. Yeah. Verse 6. Now when this was noise abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Tongues. Language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how heard we every man in our own tongue? wherein we were born. Yeah, they're listening to them in their native language. Verse 9, Parthians. Wow. You know what? I took world history in college. Never heard of the Parthian Empire. Never heard of it. You hear all about Rome. But you never heard about Parthia. Rome tried to conquer Parthia. 
Parthia kicked their rear more than once. Parthia is, the area of Parthia was in modern day Persia or Iran today, so. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia in Pontius and Asia. P-H-R-Y-G-I-A and Pamphylia in Egypt and then the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome's, uh, stranger of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? In other words, what's the meaning of this? We're all listening to them speak to us in their own language. You know, they're not speaking gibberish. I mean, they're preaching Jesus Christ to them in their own language. And you know what's interesting is if you look at the old, old Germanic, German uh, alphabet, you know, the stuff from the Middle Ages, the Germanic script, and compare it to Hebrew lettering, you'd be surprised at how, how much they look alike. Uh, I was in Germany for, oh, about a year, and uh, I was amazed when I started studying a little bit of Hebrew in Bible college, how much Hebrew and German sound alike. The words may not be the same, but the sounds are similar, very similar for some words, maybe not everything, but... And uh, German composes about, probably about 20% of the English language. Matter of fact, Old English and German are... <laughs> A lot closer than you might think. From what I understand, uh, when we were trying to break away, when the United States was trying to break away from Great Britain, um, they were just trying to decide what would be the national language. German lost by one vote, from what I understand. Matter of fact, in the Constitution, they were going to put an amendment that the you know who's could not become U.S. citizens. And uh, that also failed by one vote. So, uh, thank you, Founding Fathers, for, uh, you know, for uh, the banks. And, uh, yeah, we much appreciated. So, you know, with that in mind, I... I, you know, and when you think about it, Germany gave us the printing press. They printed the Bibles. You know, the, the first Bibles were, you know, in, in English and German. And who spread the gospel all over the world? Certainly not the uh, country that the United Nations created. No, not them. Absolutely not. So... If you look carefully, they fulfill the prophecies that God gave to Cain. Yeah, think about it. You know, but uh, that's, uh, you're not supposed to notice those kind of things. Which is why they're very, very happy that uh, our people do not bother to read the Bible anymore. Or if they do... We read the wrong one, the wrong ones. Remember something, the translators that did the King James Bible, they were believers in what they were doing, and they were scholars, unlike your modern day version, uh, version people who are absolutely non-believers and non-scholars. Zondervan supposedly the largest printer of Bibles in the English-speaking world has the exclusive print rights to the NIV Bible, which was the number one selling, and I use this term loosely, Bible, the number one selling Bible for at least one or two years in a row. Uh, their parent company is HarperCollins. 
they print The Joy of Gay Sex, a how-to manual, complete with pictures. And they print the Church of Satan Satanic Bible. Yeah, HarperCollins does. Their parent, Zondervan's parent company prints... Uh, yeah, you get the idea. And guess who their parent company is? The News Corp. Uh, Bob, who's the News Corp? Oh, well, you know them as the Fox Network. You know that old Fox? Yeah, the Fox in the Hen House. So the company that uh, supposedly a right-wing news source, uh, they're one of their subsidiaries prints the NIV, which is a study in and of itself. It's a horrible version. It's not even a version. It's it's Satan's masterpiece, if you ask me. But um, they print uh, the Joy of Gay Sex and the Satanic Bible by the Church of Satan. Yeah, it makes me real confident uh, wanting to buy their books. And by the way, Zondervan also prints the King James Bible. I don't think I would trust it, but, you know, what can I tell you? All right, well, I hope you learned something. Um, by no means do I claim to have all the truth, or do, by no means do I claim to be a prophet or anything else. I'm just a flawed idiot that uh, read the Bible a couple times. And, um, boy, I tell you what, I'm a perfect example of everything to do wrong as an unbeliever in my past year so boy i'm an expert on that ruined many 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 things so all right all blessings praise glory and honor in jesus precious name amen